IoT mm. opportunity to welcome everyone on the behalf of SLU Global. Uh, we are very happy to have Jens Bislund here today. He uh, started out as a forester and uh, have a, his research interest lies within the political and social aspects of decentralization of forest management. Uh, also climate change, mitigation and adaptation. And currently he is the Professor of Political Ecology at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, yeah, particularly worked in Tanzania, but also in India, Nepal, and in Mozambique, what I can understand. So we're very happy to have you here. And uh, we are also very happy to see so many visitors coming or participants. And we are all hoping to rethink forestry today. So please, welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to do my best to behave in accordance with uh, <laughs> the requirements of the video recording and everything else. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this chance to come here and talk. Um, thanks to Adam and Christina for inviting me. Thanks to Dill for accepting that I read his PhD thesis draft. Um, I'm very happy to be here and honored that I get this chance. I mean, even more honored that I will be video recorded. That was an unexpected uh, extra added benefit. So I'd like to talk today about rethinking forestry. And it's something that flows from, um, you could say something that has popped up at different times in, in my research career since I did my PhD more than 10 years ago. It's not something that I've ever had the chance to put together in one set of thoughts, one coherent set of thoughts. So these are um, things in motion, things that I think about, things that I read about and write about when I have a chance. And I've tried to put it together into one story today. Uh, but it's the first time that I tell this story in its full length, so to speak. So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on the arguments that I'm going to present. And as you can see, there could maybe be space for a subtitle on the first slide there. I didn't put one, but if I were to put one, I think it would be something like from domination over to care for. Um, and that goes in relation to forestry. So it's not about forests and trees per se, but it's about forestry as a profession, as a set of thoughts, uh, be they academic and practical. That's what I will talk about today. So for in the interest of full dis disclosure, this is me. This is my master's thesis and a managed forest management plan that I did as part of my training. So I am a forester. I'm part of this international cult. And I'd be interested to hear how many of you are also foresters. Are there any other foresters in the room? There's some semi-foresters and there's a few who commit completely good. Then there's more than one in the room who knows all about cubic meters, diameter, breast height, basal area, standing volume, all of this, this lingua franca of forestry that is understood all over the world by members of this uh, esoteric uh, cult. <laughs> and, um, and that's great. I'll, I'm looking forward to seeing some thoughts from you uh, who have been trained the same way that I have on, on these thoughts, which are kind of challenging to the whole premise of forestry. So what I will talk about is forestry as an imagined ideal versus a practice, because I think there is somewhat of a distance between what we think of as forestry, as a profession, and what goes on in practice. There's a distance there. And I'll talk about why there is this distance. I'll talk about why, in spite of this distance, that we still, as foresters, cling on to the ideal of forestry. Um, and I'll talk about uh, why I think we need to rethink this ideal to kind of merge uh, or to reduce the distance between practice and ideal. And I'll do that on the basis of some historical studies on forestry and some contemporary observations. Mm -hmm. And I'll sprinkle it with some of my own research, uh, but much of this relies on the good work of many other people uh, than me. So this first uh, figure here is a contemporary representation of the role of forestry. And I can't read it from here. I hope some of you can read it from wherever you see it. But it displays different types, different actors' views on the role of forestry today. So, for instance, the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration will talk about the role of forestry as creating multifunctional landscapes. National and regional governments uh, would maybe talk about forestry as a way of maintaining state control of forest use, maybe implicitly at least. 
the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues would maybe talk about forestry as a way to ensure that Indigenous people can continue their way of life. So forestry is multi-purpose. I think probably everyone in this room would agree on that and would agree that different actors uh, may have these different perspectives of what, on what forestry uh, should do. That is not contentious today, I think. However, I think it's worth keeping in mind that forestry is an old profession and an old academic field. It was initiated in the 1700s as in Central Europe as part of the initiation of modern statehood. And forestry uh, was about timber management and revenue collection and control and legibility of forests around that time, serving the interests of rulers in Central Europe. And that is the model upon which, or the purposes upon which forestry science uh, was developed. And only quite recently in the history of this profession have these multiple purposes come into view, as illustrated in this figure. And my argument today is that while most of us can agree today that forests serve multiple purposes, foresters are quite ill-equipped to uh, cater for these purposes and support this. So I would argue that the past of forestry, its long development as a mono-purpose discipline, continues to haunt the present today. And I'll oh, try to support that argument. Sorry, I'm fiddling a little bit with different buttons and papers around here, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, so what is forestry? For those who are not initiated, I'll just give a kind of a quick overview. So forestry is really about um, setting aside forest entities from the general landscape. That was the premise upon which it was built. Before the invention of modern forestry in the 1700s, there was no such thing as forests. There were maybe landscapes. Landscapes were also in themselves invented at some point in time as a conceptual, uh, as a concept. And the same thing with forests. So at the time when forests were invented, they were set aside from the other landscape. And in practice, that meant that people were evicted, their uses were made illegal of forest. So people who grazed in the forest, people who lived in the forest, people who farmed in areas with trees were kicked out of forests, forests were set aside, they were demarcated. Measurements were made of forests to make them legible to distant rulers. Modeling was invented on the basis of measurements of individual trees to create growth models that would then serve the purpose of prediction and management. So foresters imagine that they can foresee and predict the development of forests in response to management prescriptions. That's the whole idea of forestry. That's the whole notion of why we need a professional forest. Forestry mm -hmm. is to enable us to optimize these ecosystems so that they can render the services and goods that we want. So it's about mastery over ecosystems. It's a fundamental part of modernity, and in that time, modern statehood, the rise of modern statehood. <clears throat> and forestry then traveled throughout the world from its origins in Central Europe, and I've already talked about its initial purposes, etc., etc., that you can see here, but it tra traveled all over the world through colonialism, imperialism, and after the colonial period, through international forestry institutions such as the Food and Agriculture Organization that today advises governments all over the world on how to uh, demarcate, measure, model, uh, optimize forest ecosystems for different values. And forestry also, <coughs> I would argue, managed to transform, transform some northern European forests and, crucially, forest-people relations across the globe. So that is really a global thing that forestry has done, plus, of course, the imagination of what forestry is. And I would argue that this view of forests remains the standard today. When I travel and when I meet foresters from all over the world, we immediately speak the same language. We've been trained in approximately the same way. Um, so it is really a very standardized profession and the, the notion of forestry has really been successful in, uh, in, in traveling throughout the world. The next question is, how successful has forestry then been in living up to this ideal of mastery, control, prediction, optimization. And to talk about that, I want to go to some historical studies. So these are just a selection of, of really wonderful books on environmental history that I've had the privilege to read. And I won't be able to give you examples from all of them, but I'll pick a few. Um, and there's, of course, many more. And um, the reason that I want to use these sources to talk about this is that forestry is a long-term business, so to speak. So even though today there are uh, quite old uh, 
experimental studies on the effects of different forest management systems around the world that conform to the present standards of natural science and social ecological research, they are still extremely young in relation to a forest or a tree generation, say a tree generation or the life of a tree. So I have taken to these historical studies because they allow me and others to see the imaginations of foresters 100 years ago or 200 years ago, how foresters imagined that their practices in the present would affect forests in the future. And then we can see what happened uh, as a fact after the 100 years or after a longer time perspective. So it's really an interesting way to understand um, how foresters have imagined uh, the futures that they were trying to craft uh, over time, and then we can go and see what actually happened, and we can maybe perceive, uh, we can maybe get a sense of, of why there is this distance between ideal and practice uh, through this. So I'll talk you through a few of these historical uh, studies. So the first one is from Nigeria. It's written by Pauline von Hellemann, and the title is Things Fall Apart. So the same title as Chinua Achebe's very famous novel, who's a Nigerian writer. And the premise of this book is a story of uh, present decline and past grandeur. So she uh, gives evidence or examples of how people in southern Nigeria today talk about forest as being dis uh, destroyed, managed poorly, and they uh, set that in opposition to uh, a past colonial time where forests were managed proper. She then goes on in a political, ecological tradition, or an environmental history tradition, to look at different sources, uh, such as archival studies, <coughs> reports, uh, travel reports from colonial officers, etc., etc., to document that also during the colonial period there were immense uh, problems of forest management. Forest policies that were written on paper were only practiced in a small, small part of the actual forest estate. Reservation only happened quite recently as compared to a tree generation, implying that some forests were only reserved maybe 60 years ago. Um, and that uh, many of the ecological theories underlying forest management did not work out as foresters had hoped. And the next study is by Tadeo Sonseri from Tanzania. And this study illustrates many of the same things that the study from, by Pauline von Hellemann illustrates, but also shows how the ambitions of foresters were thwarted by uh, a lack of market demand or too much market demand for timber. So before the Second World War, uh, there was really no international market demand for timber from East Africa for various reasons. But during the war, as some markets closed down, some colonies became inaccessible, suddenly market demand for timber picked up in Tanzania. And during and after the war, the ideas of foresters, the harvesting plants of foresters in the few forest reserves where such plants existed, were defied by market demand. So the market demanded more wood from these foresters than foresters could give in accordance with their plants. So before the war, they could not implement their plans because no one wanted to help them harvest the timber. After the war, the plans <laughs> had to follow the market demand. So forest uh, harvesting regulations had to be revised continuously to, lead to, to meet this market demand. Again, implying that this notion of control was, was defied by, in this case, markets. Another interesting spin on this story is that I have a PhD student who works in Tanzania today, and he documents very carefully how only in out of the 400 and approximately 450 government forest reserves today in Tanzania, maybe 20 have a management plan. And we haven't even looked into the quality of that plan, whether it actually represents the forest. Again, illustrating that this idea that forests are managed and that foresters have control, the resources and the ability to control these forests, is defied by reality, if we look a little further. Moving on to Mexico, a wonderful study by the anthropologist um, Matthew Andrews. Andrew Matthews, sorry. And I think the key message of that study is that this distance between the ideal and reality also is a challenge to foresters. So he documents in detail how government forest officers are uneasy about the distance between their ideal knowledge their abstract knowledge expressed in volumes, basal areas, diameter, breast height, and the ecological complexity of forest as they are found around the country. And he specifically focuses on hedo forestry, where communities are managing forests in collaboration with these forest officers. 
and how forest officers are confronted with challenges by managing communities about their ecological theory, <coughs> defined by evidence, as you can see with your, with your eyes in the field. So, in particular, the role of fire in regeneration, that foresters were promoting fire suppression, was countered by massive evidence on the ground by communities that fire was actually helpful in relation to regenerating the types of trees that, that uh, were valuable at the time, which ecological research has also since proven. So, one of the things that comes out of that study is that foresters are only experts and gain authority through that expertise when they can talk in abstract terms about forests. That allows their expertise to travel between different regions. It flattens out the complexity. But in the meeting between foresters and forest communities, this complexity is again unfolded, thereby challenging these notions of expertise. It's a wonderful study, and everyone who has the time and are interested in forestry should definitely have a look at it. Another example is from my own work with my very good colleague, Christian Pieligor Hansen, <coughs> who is, I would say, the world's authoritative expert on forestry in Ghana. And one small vignette in this study that he, is, he did, and I was lucky to be part of, on the forest history of Ghana, is how a particular species in the 1970s was poisoned by foresters. Only, of course, in a small fraction of the forest area, because it's extremely expensive to do these pre-felling treatments across a large area, and there was no resources for it. But it was done, nevertheless. Shortly thereafter, a decade thereafter, this became one of the most valuable species on the international timber market. Harvesting uh, progressed aggressively after this species until it was commercially extinct, and it's now on the red list. All within 50 years, much less than a tree generation, and most standard forest management plans are, have a 30-year lifetime. Again, defying this notion that we can predict and control the future, <laughs> as forestry is really premised on. Sorry, I'll just have a sip of water. <laughs> Moving on this time to North America, a wonderful study by the environmental historian Nancy Langston, focusing on giving a, a really detailed view to past imaginaries by foresters and uncertainties and press and then fast forwarding a hundred years to what then happened in terms of these imaginations. It's an, a fantastic historical ethnographic study. Uh, and it's wonderfully written. She's a very, very good writer, Nancy. So it's really it's like reading a novel only you're reading very, very good uh, scholarship, I would say. Um, she shows how foresters and settlers and foresters arrived to this area in, in the northwestern U.S. in the late um, 19th and early 20th century. And what they found there <clears throat> upon arriving were these beautiful, uh, old, what they perceived as old-growth forest stands of uh, Pinus ponderosa, yellow pine. And the impression that foresters had being trained in different types of, of forest biomes in, in, in the eastern US and Europe was that this was old growth forest that was direly in need of rejuvenation. So foresters set uh, about to create a very uh, aggressive harvesting policy that would create this rejuvenation and would regenerate this forest. Uh, and, and, and create a, a faster growth rate than what was perceived to be happening in these forests. And to do that, they have to put down, they have to attract investors, put down railways, the <coughs> unexplored territory, put up sawmills. So a lot of investment was made, which has to be repaid. So in that dynamic, foresters saw that they had to shorten the, the, the harvesting cycles to uh, allow investors to have their investments uh, repaid. And so the Initial premise was that after 80 years, foresters could return and do a second reharvesting. Uh, so this unfolded so that this whole area would be harvested all over once in 80 years, and then you could come back and return uh, and, and start over harvesting again. And that was on the basis of that, uh, har sawmills were established, etc., etc. Over time, foresters started to push for regeneration, so different treatments to ensure that not only through uh, harvesting, but other treatments to ensure that regeneration would happen. What came up in many places, so it's a very complex story, you have to read it, but in many places, the, the large story here is that what came up was not ponderosa pine, but white fir. And they came up in extremely dense stands, and they grew up to a certain si size, and then, uh, what's it called, bark beetles attacked them, mm -hmm 
and they dried out in some conspicuously dry years and were suffering and drying out and dying. <coughs> oh, sorry. There's a wonderful quote here uh, from 1906 before all of these disasters started happening, showing how foresters believed that this harvesting was really the, the, the right approach. But what ended up happening was massive forest fires and ecological and social tragedy in the 1980s when there was no more ponderosa pine left and the sawmills had to close. Uh, and much of the area at that time looked like this. So really defying the expectations of foresters 80 to 100 years earlier, completely different scenario than they had imagined with the best tools that they had. And of course, the book also presents evidence that many foresters were uneasy and saw this happening. But things had been set in motion that were difficult to stop. And so the train rolled on, and this is where we ended 80 years later. Just another example, and I don't think I need to spend much time on this, but we've all, we all know about the forest dieback uh, story in Central Europe in the 1980s, which was initially linked to sulfur deposits and air pollution. But if you look into the research today, I think the main thing that I take out of the research on what actually happened in the 1980s is that we don't really know. We don't really know how this uh, massive dieback compares to earlier periods of variation in, in forest structure in Central Europe, and we don't know the causal factors behind it. Sulfur might have played a role, but there was also second generation homogenized forest stands that were initially planted in first generation when modern forestry was invented in, such, in Central Europe, build up of uh, certain nutrients and maybe deficiency of other nutrients in forest soil, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a complex story. And I think the present day science doesn't really tell us what exactly happened and can we expect these things to come back uh, recycling again and again. And I think there are new challenges on the horizon. This is a quick example from from Denmark in 1999, what's called the December storm. And I worked in the area where it hit as a forester at the time. And it, it cut down what corresponds to two years of harvest in Denmark, in all of Denmark, in one night. Um, and was the largest, or the, the storm with the, with the highest wind speed recorded ever, was since uh, 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 more, uh, uh, even higher wind speeds have been recorded in 2013. <laughs> Just telling of maybe new challenges on their way. The next example is from here, it's from Sweden. I'm sure you all know the August fire in 2014. Um, was the worst fire in four decades, I've been told. And it coincided with an unusually warm and dry August. Um, next example is from Chile, the worst fire ever in 2016. Uh, an enormous area burned and no way of controlling that. And the, world, uh, the global tree cover loss in 2016 was the highest recorded ever, 50% higher than 2015, or almost anyway. And especially premeditated on fires fire as a new and completely uncontrollable menace to forests. And of course, many people link this to climate changes. And again, I think what I'm saying here is that we don't really know, and we can certainly not necessarily control these events in the way that we often tend to imagine and in the way that forestry tells us we can. So come back this ideal versus the practice. Notions of control, prediction, <coughs> organization confounded by these complex and changing ecologies, by political, economic constraints of various kinds. Yet, I would argue these notions persist today. Um, <coughs> there are today, I'm so sorry you can't read this. Um, I'm actually also sorry that I can't because I can't remember what it says. Or what it says. <laughs> but there are today calls for um, forests to come and help us solve some of the global sustainability problems that we are facing. Um, this is a book written by Francis Seymour in 2015, Why Forest, Why Now?, telling us that forests can cool the planet and can do so cheaply and fast. And this was written in 2016, and I don't know how many of you remember the report by Lord Stern, which uh, also said the same thing in 2016 that forestry, and that became the starting point for the whole idea of red, that forestry was perhaps the cheapest and fastest route to, or and then and, and, and a cheap and fast route to reducing emissions from uh, CO2 emissions. These calls are now repeated a decade later, 
um, which is interesting, I think, given the history of Red Plus in the in the decade that has that has uh, gone between here. Another focusing on natural climate solutions, this time by the Nature Conservancy, saying that if we want to stay under two degrees, um, natural climate solutions can provide close to 40% of the emissions reductions needed. That translates in the underlying study, which was published last year in PNAS, into a lot about forestry. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but forests are at the top <laughs> of this graph, and you can see how the arrows, or uh, sorry, the columns go far out to the to the right, implying that forests are a major part of these presumed natural solutions uh, to climate change. Reforestation is actually envisaged as the main uh, solution, which is interesting given how difficult reforestation is, how costly it is, how fragile uh, large-scale afforestation projects often are if you look back into the history of those, which I haven't been able to really discuss here because of time. And of course, there are new technologies and ideas invented. So this is the idea that drones can fix our forest problem by planting 100,000 trees a day. No doubt this technology exists and works, and I've even uh, had the time to look a little bit into this. And it's, it looks promising again, but it also, again, given the difficulties of controlling these complex ecologies, makes me think, is that really a solution? Can we really imagine that this will work? And, of course, businesses are coming along, and this is a report also from last year saying that there has never been a better time to invest in land restoration, afforestation, and there's a great demand for businesses that can deliver large projects cost-effectively. So we're again being told that it's possible through forestry to create solutions to the global sustainability problems that we're facing, which I think stands in stark opposition to uh, how forestry has challenged in managing natural ecosystems over time, which I've just shown. And I don't think there is proof of concept that this is possible. This is an example of red, which is, there's a, currently a big debate about whether red is dead or whether people will still continue <coughs> to invest in this. So it was, as many of you I'm sure know, put on the stage 10 years ago, and in the, in the meantime, around $10 billion have been invested in trying to get this animal uh, up and running, and I think you could say with some confidence today that there are really no good examples of Red Plus financing forest uh, conservation <coughs> successfully around the world at a larger scale. There are some few private uh, operators doing this, but there are great questions about leakage, about, this leakage, about additionality that remain unanswered today. And I've done a little bit of work on this myself, showing how 100 million US dollars was invested in this in Tanzania, ended up reproducing many of the same practices and institutions that were already working in a few select pilot projects around the country, as opposed to um, arresting deforestation at a larger scale. So I think it's really a question, I think the question is really open, can we do this through forestry? Is forestry really the solution and what would it take? Also, Obviously, if we want to go down this road, which many are doing already, we're seeing a return to a fortress forestry, where we in the 1990s and 2000s had maybe a bit more benign policy of inviting people back into the forests where they were evicted from 200 to 50 years ago. We now see a return to fortress forestry uh, approaches where people are being kicked out of forests or out of their lands because they ne are needed for afforestation, human rights abuses, and of course people go elsewhere and we have major problems of leakage. Uh, we cannot only look at these projects in isolation, and that's a problem that hasn't been solved yet. Another thing that I have looked in particular is how this uh, strengthened emphasis on measurement and control uh, also recreates professionalized forestry in processes of participatory forestry, which still exist around the world, where I have worked with colleagues in Nepal, Tanzania, Bolivia, India, uh, and elsewhere, and we find the same pattern that participatory reforms are couched in these, or our um, reforms are couched in participatory rhetoric, but in practice they reproduce professionalized <coughs> forestry, forestry proper, as Pauline von Hellermann would say, um, whereby communities are asked to produce detailed and expensive forest management plans before they can gain authority over forests, plans that are couched in the monopurpose forestry science, 
to produce timber, whereas people are using these forests for all sorts of other things than timber, implying that they have low relevance. Also, we've looked at many of these plants. They're of extremely low quality because they're so costly to produce and there's no resources to produce them. Foresters and communities take shortcuts, so the plans give indications that a forest has 100 cubic meters per hectare, where, in, as a matter of fact, given that we put uh, enough money in to measure it carefully, it may only have 50. Many plans are copy-paste work. So, for instance, in, in Nepal, we've also looked at this, and Dil, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, the re with this research, reviewing 30, 40 plans, and it's obvious that they're copy-paste work because foresters are under pressure to produce them, otherwise they can get fired or transferred. So, of course, they work together with communities to produce a sense, to produce plans that, in effect, actually produce ignorance about the state of the forest. So plans and science, rather than informing and guiding management, becomes a way of legitimating a continuation of management, which is, in essence, a waste of resources. And also... Uh, creates elite capture and opportunities for rent seeking. So we're quite critical of that, and you're, I would love to discuss it with any of you who have other experiences. And we argue that these dynamics are, are um, strengthened by neoliberal approaches, market-based approaches to forestry such as RED, because to commodify forests, you would have to render them commensurable, legible at a distance so that they can be marketed. You need to create carbon out of a <coughs> complex ecosystem and that requires standardization techniques of monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, strengthening this notion of, of, uh, of monopurpose forestry. Also, the development industry has strengthened these logics, I would argue, and there I built on the work by James Ferguson and many others, showing the tendency of development to render things technical and to create a need for capacity building. And obviously, if you need to have standardized forest management techniques, communities will need to have their capacity built, implying that claims of low capacity among communities also follow from the way that we frame forestry. If we frame forestry in different ways, communities might be the most capable foresters that we have. Moving on, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not boring you already. Um, so this is not only, I think, a question of neoliberalism and development industry and political economy. It's also a question of cultural institutional reproduction. And there I built very much on the work by Hemant Oja, uh, who talked about how forest bureaucracies had developed a certain doxa that disciplined individual foresters into thinking in certain ways. So institutional socialization. And I think that happens in all institutions, including academic institutions. And we have a PhD student who looks at this in Tanzania, and he shows how Education is also key in reproducing this, whereby uh, the teachers who teach forestry students forestry are also consultants to, uh, to, uh, to international donors, <coughs> the international technical advisors of whom are often foresters by training and very technical foresters. So they demand a certain form of expertise, which these teachers then deliver, and they use their consultancies as examples in the teaching. Thus reproducing one sense of forestry. And of course, they need to represent these cases as successful. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to go back to the donor and reproduce their livelihood. So it's really becomes this closed circle of, of expertise where one form of forestry is never really um, challenged. And I think Rebecca Lava's work, Fields and Streams, which I have the pleasure of reading, is an example of that just within another field of stream restoration, where she shows how the U.S. government's way of structuring uh, who can do stream restoration using certain certifications create one dominant hegemonic approach to stream restoration, which does not have a <coughs> clear scientific superiority in terms of its use value, but becomes the winning concept because of a political economy and the structuring of a field by, in this case, the U.S. government. So I want to end on talking, how I, or talking a little bit about coming back to this domination of nature, where I think that foresters fall into a discourse which some have called eco-modernism. The discourse whereby we can solve global sustainability problems by use of technology and by separating ourselves as humans from nature, freeing ourselves from nature. Um, Eco-modernists see um, or perceive the uh, modern or developed, however you want to call it, the West, 
as having liberated itself from nature and use uh, environmental goodness curves as evidence of that, showing that as we the economy develops and people gain more uh, well-being, <clears throat> the environmental pressure tends to relieve. So, for instance, there's a uh, relationship between GDP and forest cover, so that many countries in this part of the world are regaining forest cover. And this, that is used as evidence that if all the world could do like that, we would solve our environmental problems. Of course, the problem with that is that that does not take into account that these pockets of sustainability depend on very unsustainable practices all over the world. And as we're now facing global sustainability problems, we cannot really uh, absolve ourselves by importing coal or oil or palm oil or whatever it may be from distant regions. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the bioeconomy, but I think I'm going to skip that and go straight to this one. And it's a really a shame you can't see it. This is a really wonderful graph illustrating why the eco-modernist idea, I think, is a faulty idea. It shows the global material extraction. So here we're not talking regions or nations, but we're looking at global. Um, it shows non-metallic minerals, metal ore, fossil fuels, and biomass. The global extraction of these. And it shows how that has tripled over the last 40 years. And importantly to my argument here, it shows a recoupling as opposed to the promise in eco-modernism of a decoupling of economy and environmental footprint. If you look at the last decade from 2000 to 2010, <coughs> you can see that, the, that the, the extraction rate is steeper and steeper. And that is a period where global population growth has uh, slowed down and where the economy has also uh, been relatively slower than in the decades preceding implying that we need more material um, extraction per GDP, increasing material extraction per GDP as opposed to earlier, which is completely the opposite of the promise of uh, eco-modernism, that we can decouple economic growth from material extraction. Here we see a recoupling, actually, when we look at this data at the global level. So I think that really flies in the face of ideas that we can continue consuming and producing as we're used to while uh, relieving these uh, global sustainability problems. And I think it flies in the face of these notions of how we can solve our global sustainability problems through afforestation or through improved forest management. Because obviously afforestation will create other pressures elsewhere. And often afforestation requires resources that are taken from somewhere. Uh, many afforestation projects use pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, etc., etc. And of course, maybe it's important to mention that I think this recoupling of economic activity to material extraction, they also argue in this report, is a consequence of the shifting of industry from areas where production has been more efficient to areas where it's less efficient, areas where environmental costs and the labor costs are lower, or rather the environmental costs are not taken into consideration. So the deindustrialization of the West, the moving, the shifting of production to other regions is what underlies this figure. So in conclusion, and I'll wrap this up because I can see some of you are wondering what I'm saying here. In conclusion, I think forestry has, I think we can say that forestry has never really been implemented in larger areas of natural forests. If we look back in the history, if you look at the colonial foresters and also post-colonial regimes of forestry outside of, let's say, Sweden, Denmark, and a few other countries, maybe North America, there's really very little actual forest management ongoing. Many of these natural forests have never been really managed. <coughs> Rather, forestry has legitimated as opposed to guided what has happened in terms of exploitation. We've never really, as foresters, attained an understanding of these complex ecosystems that allow us to predict and manage in accordance with the ideal. And also, I think we can say that management and use of forests by local people focuses on multiple values other than timber, on which our model is premised, and rests on other forms of knowledge than scientific forestry. And often, I think we can say that it's pretty successful. And I think we can say that this scientific bureaucratic forestry model is a poor fit to the social ecological reality of forestry. And we also can say that it produces, reproduces elitism and inequality where it's found. And I think that foresters are actively contributing to keeping alive this notion that we can optimize, we can overcome nature's binds, we can control this complexity when we just get a little more information. We're selling that promise as foresters. And that reproduces 
problems. It reproduces a culture within forestry education that is problematic. It reproduces neoliberal imaginaries and the development industry looking for win-win solutions. And it also reproduces this eco-modernist vision, which is highly problematic if we really want to start dealing with global sustainability problems. So I argue that we need to rethink forestry, and I've created a list of what I think we could do. And I don't think I'll walk you through it because I think you can guess what I want to say here anyway. So I think I'll just slowly move forward to talk about, sorry, I wanted to say that there are some things I think we need to rethink within the realm of forestry, which also includes, I think, changing forest teaching curriculums. But then I think our relation to the surrounding world is really important. I think we need as foresters to go out and acknowledge that forests and trees cannot be the silver bullet solution to global sustainability problems because the fate of forests cannot be disentangled from global commodity production processes. We cannot have our biomass and our natural forests both, or our palm oil. And a market-based large-scale expansion of forestry in the global south will compromise the livelihoods of some of the world's poorest people. And it will face fierce resistance from below. It might not even be feasible. History shows that us that again, that these ideas of foresters are often met with fierce resistance that defies the plans of foresters. And we don't know how climate change and other long-term changes in biotic and abiotic factors will affect the health of forests. Therefore, we cannot predict how the global forest estate will uh, contribute or not to the global carbon balance. For these reasons, we cannot uphold the promise of forestry, I would argue. Thanks. Uh, we have 10 minutes for some questions. Those who want to stay after to engage in a discussion with uh, Jens are very welcome to do that. First, we have uh, Professor Adam. Yeah. One book I was surprised you didn't mention was War Thompson and Warburton, Himala Uncertainty on a Himalayan Scale, which to me is one of the classic texts problematizing the very nature of forestry, and it, I think is a central text that um, has been lost sight of. The first comment. The second one, I would actually take, you know, the history of forestry back further than you did, and then we were discussing <coughs> last night. I mentioned the work of Oliver Rackham, um, because actually if you go back to the 12th, 13th century of forestry in the UK, by that stage all the primary forests had been lost. Most of the forestry was privatised. It was intensively managed for use. And that history of forest use is extremely important in understanding the forest transition in the UK on a basis of private forestry. And the whole question of land relations underpinning forestry seems to me an extremely important element that, again, is part of the story of how a resource has been appropriated. And just as a historical curiosity, the notion of the forestation actually come, goes back, if you look at the 12th and 13th century medieval history in England, a forestation was actually a return to the people of forestry that had been taken from them by the monarchy and appropriated for hunting rights. So a forestation was a return of forest rights to people rather than the way in which it's, called, it's represented now. You want to... Just, I mean, thank you for that. And I definitely, I haven't read, as we discussed also yesterday, I haven't read all the Rackham, and I yeah. definitely have to do that. Um, and I, yeah, there were many things I didn't say, which I would have loved to say, and, and, and that could be, I wouldn't have said that because I didn't know it, but one of the things that maybe I want to add is that I think it's also interesting how, I don't know what the story is in, in your different countries, but the story in Denmark is that professionalized forestry saved Denmark from a resource bind. But, and that was because in the, around the turn, around 1800, we had like 2% forest left, according to whatever estimates we have. And there was a, energy constraint and, and also the returns in agriculture were falling at the time. But what solved us was maybe professionalized forestry, but it was certainly also coal from Britain and it was guano from South America, right? So, um, so I think that the idea of forestry as a salvation is often tied up to these hidden uh, imports of, of energy that then has effects elsewhere and that, that that kind of solution we just can't build upon anymore, right? Because the problems are global this time. 
unless we want to go to Mars. Sorry. Long yeah, answer. You, you mentioned that <coughs> rethinking forestry means also rethinking curricula. Yeah. And I think that's very important for this university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a background as agronomist, and everything you have talked about forestry, forestry can be said yeah. about agronomy and agronomist. So I think for us in this uh, university, it's extremely important now to think about how should we rethink curricula of all our trained programs. Yeah. Uh, you have more thoughts on that. Uh, what, 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 what kind of changes do you want to see? Yeah, yeah I think... <clears throat> so, there are some things about what kind of changes I'd like to see. I'd like to <laughs> see much more emphasis on these uh, social metabolisms and material metabolisms that go into our production of various things in agriculture, for instance, I think that should be emphasized much more strongly in teaching curricula. So we need to know the energy balance of different forms of production. But we also need to know the social consequences of different forms of production. And we need to know the uncertainties underlying our predictions of how different productions will, 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 will work or not. But I think the major challenge there is that it comes up against not only a political economy. So I teach at the Faculty of Science and my department is uh, heavily in bed with uh, Ministry of Agriculture. So whatever I'm saying about eco-modernism and the problems of energy balances, etc., etc., runs up against a strong political economy actually at the department uh, and at the university as such. So I think for reform, I don't know how to do reform. I have some ideas about what we should do, but how to get there is really a major challenge. Um, and I don't know whether we can solve it within the university system. Also because people's careers are online. Yeah. And um, scientific prestige, right, and scientific authority. And yeah, so I don't know how to, how to get there. It's really, it's really a huge challenge. But, I mean, we'll have to start somewhere um, and going around talking about it and trying to... I'm creating courses in political ecology and environmental justice at the Faculty of Science at KU. And that is definitely challenging some of the notions of what good science is and, and, and what we should be teaching at the Faculty of Science. And I'm allowed to do that for now. Um, but how far we can push those boundaries and, and we're not all equally able to do that. I'm, I'm lucky I have tenure now, at least in principle, but if you're an assistant <laughs> professor trying to craft a career, that might not be possible uh, <coughs> for you as an individual. So I think it also comes down, actually, to the need for academics to organize in the end, because it's difficult to stand alone with these very heretic uh, thoughts. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a rather comment here, which I'm, I, I find it very interesting, and I agree on almost all your, what you're saying. And I, uh, we have been studying within our project, which includes Christine and Adam and Lennart here. We've been studying, you know, red projects, and we've been studying community-based forest management projects. And when we started, we had a kind of idea about the community-based forest management, that they were, so to say, be the more kind of good example. However, for example, if you take, let's say, Two examples, one community-based forest management in Brazil, another one in Tanzania. It turns out you have to ask like questions, who participates, what conditions do they participate, and what type of uh, economic and social tensions do these create? Because it shows that these type, or at least our research does in these places, that this type of participatory research actually needs a lot of external resources, capital, etc. And it's very complex. So you need to have some, you know, kind of elite groups that work with it, which creates tension within the villages, um, external capital, and in order to keep the population happy, you promise them large returns, which almost never materialize. And um, the example when we've been looking in Tanzania was huge tensions, not least between pastoralists and agriculturalists. And in Brazil, that at the moment, is just falling down everywhere, and you have this kind of scramble for the Amazon, which is is going on. So they haven't been working. It's a kind of, you know, trying to, we see it as a bit as a kind of, well, you can't, but when you have this type of modernity and preservation of forest and 
safeguarding for local people. That's kind of equation that really doesn't add up, but that doesn't work. What's your comment about that? Well, I agree. I mean, I think there are things that can be solved at the local level. So, for instance, you mentioned pastoralism and, mm. um, and, uh, and forestry. Mm. So, for some reason in Tanzania, mm. those two things are seen as being in opposition. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, right? I mean, there's a lot of dogmas out there. Also, um, all hunting in Tanzania is illegal, by definition. I mean, you can't even catch a little bird. Which is ridiculous, right? Because bush pigs and and, mm. and, uh, and and other animals come into the farms and destroy farmers' crops. And there's tons of them, and they don't have a particular value to tourism. They don't have; they're not in any danger of getting extinct. So why is it so criminalized? Mm. And the same goes for fire, which is also criminalized. You need to create 20 kilometers long fire breaks to do community forestry. Mm. Who has the labor to do that on pay? No one, right? So there's all these. Mm. Ir- irrational and irrelevant obstacles to create participatory forestry. And that's the kind of local scale mm. issues that I think can be solved, but it requires a rethinking of forestry. Mm. But of course, we are in a bind at the global level because all these small scale solutions are often overrided by mega projects, by large scale land grabbing, by these frontiers that are developing. And of course, they cannot in any way uh, withstand those pressures. And The solution to those, I think, comes back to a global elite that is through its consumption patterns, and I'm part of it. Mm. I mean, I looked, I checked my privilege by entering my income in, in the, on the webpage, how rich are you? And I'm like top 1% globally. Mm. So I'm part of it. My consumption patterns drives much of what's going on globally in terms of resource pressures. So I think the, it comes home to us. And in, as individuals, we can't change what is going on globally, no doubt. But I think as academics, but also as citizens, maybe we need to start voting differently and persuade our families to do the same or get out into the streets and and make some change. Because those resource frontiers will keep on moving unless I think someone acts. And I think it's unlikely that the growing global middle class in Southeast Asia and elsewhere will act first because they still look up to the privileges that people like me enjoy, right? Which is super radical and super uncomfortable to think about, but I mean, I think that's where we need to start the change.